Wirelessly enabling your latest project has never been easier. For 10 US dollars, the ESP32 by Espressive puts the power of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth directly into your hands. What is up guys? Welcome back to another low level learning tutorial. In today's video, I'll be showing you all how to put the power of ESP32 into your hands and set up the Wi-Fi and TCP controller on the device. And by the end of this video, you'll know how to connect your ESP32 to a wireless network and send and receive data over TCP for your latest IoT project. The ESP32, while powerful, is arguably very difficult to program. And while there is extensive documentation in its API, the start to finish flow of how to enable the Wi-Fi interface, create a socket, connect to a remote server, etc., is not entirely straightforward. Now, there is the cop-out option of using the simplified Arduino interface for the ESP32, which extracts away all the detail and optimization of how the device works, but, we don't do that here. So in today's video, we're writing this in C. To do this, you first need to have the ESP32 IDF installed. If you don't already have that set up, feel free to check out my previous video on the ESP32. I'll put a card right here for that video and a link in the description. Now, let's get to the code. Normally in my videos when I'm programming with you guys, I actually run through and code in front of you line by line and explain what my thought process is when I'm doing that programming. In this video, I'm not gonna do that primarily because there is so much code to go through and I think a video where I just type in front of you would not be very exciting. So instead, I'm gonna walk through this code that I've already written that connects to a wireless network, connects to a host, gets some information from that host and then does something with it and kind of explain to you how that works. Now, the code enters at this function called app main. If you remember from our previous ESP32 tutorial, the app main is the entry point to free RTOS where it creates the main task where the user is able to insert their code. So here we have app main where our code runs. There's a bunch of boilerplate stuff here. It's not very interesting or important. Uh, this is actually stolen from a previous example where we initialize the NVS or the non-volatile storage in Flash. That is where we're going to eventually store our Wi-Fi config and we need this to be initialized before we can do that. Every time we boot up the device in our code here, we check to see if there are any free pages left in the flash. And if there aren't, we completely erase the flash and then reinitialize it to give us room and then make sure that there were no errors in doing that. Once we've initialized the flash, we can do our connect Wi-Fi function. And obviously we check to see if that fails after it gets ran. And up here is the connect Wi-Fi function where the meat and potatoes of this tutorial is, right? So the Wi-Fi function does what it says in this comment, connect to the Wi-Fi and return the result. Did we or did we not successfully connect? And we track that in a status variable here. I broke the code up into major events where things are happening in these star comments. And then beneath the star comments are the double slash comments where singular events are happening, right? So this is like the big summary and these are the little parts. Within each function, you see this ESP error check. All that's doing is checking that the return value of the ESP API call is zero. And if it's not zero, it throws an abort and then it tells us why it broke. So here we just initialize the entire network interface driver of the ESP32. No parameters required for that. That's very default stuff. The big thing that happens here, and it'll be a, kind of a theme of this tutorial, is we create what's called the default event loop. So the ESP32 is designed to be written via event-driven programming, where there's actually an infinite loop happening in the ESP32, and it checks to see if different events have occurred in the ESP32. And then once an event has occurred, it checks through a list of callback functions that we set up and if we have a callback function registered with a certain event, then it calls that function and allows us to take action. And we'll explain how that works down here a little bit. But we create that default event loop so that it begins checking for events in the background. Now within the network interface driver for the ESP32, we create what's called a default Wi-Fi station. It basically just says, hey, we're going to do Wi-Fi and get ready. Then we def create a default Wi-Fi config. This config structure will eventually have your uh, SSID that you're connecting to, the password for that SSID, the type of authentication you're doing, so WPA versus WPA2 versus WEP, et cetera. So by default, we create a default one, so there's no SSID, no password. This just allows us to get the Wi-Fi interface moving and you know start programming events against it. We are going to create an event group. So what an event group does is it allows us to check the output of an event that gets called and see if our event was successful or not. So again, I'll go into this in more detail in the event handler itself. Just know that this is where the output of the event is going to live. And this is a global variable. It actually lives up here in the top of the code, right? So this is our 
event group where all the status information gets held for the event. Okay, so the big meat and potatoes, and what was kind of confusing for me, but it took me a minute to figure out, but I've actually got it pretty down pat, is the ESP event handler instance register. So in ESP32, like I said, there's a giant loop running and it's checking for different things that are happening and seeing, hey, does the user have an event handler registered for this event? If the answer is yes, it will call this function. So I set up two event handlers for us to do an action on. The first is, if I see a Wi-Fi event, and if it's any Wi-Fi event type. So normally you specify the Wi-Fi base event, and then I could say Wi-Fi station connect or Wi-Fi station disconnect as kind of a filter to say what I do and do not call this function for. But in this case, I use the ESP event NEID global catch-all, which says if I literally see any Wi-Fi event, I wanna call this function and do something. And then this null, don't worry about that. And here we just say, this is the instance ID of our event handler. And we use that later to eventually close our event handler and unregister us from that event loop. And then same thing down here, I instantiate another uh, event handler for an IP event that says, hey, if my station, if me, if I got an IP, I wanna run this function. So basically we set up one for Wi-Fi events and then one for a very particular IP event. And we'll show you why that matters here in a second. So we set up the config of our Wi-Fi controller, and this is where you normally put your, you know, your SSID, SSID for me, and I'll do my password, right? Which is like, you know, super secure password. I'm not actually gonna use my real stuff because I don't want you internet gremlins to come hunt me down, but you have SSID and your password and you put your authentication mode, right? So for us, it's gonna be authentication, uh, WPA2, PSK, pre-shared key. And you can just put these as defaults. These are the capable and required. These are just pretty boilerplate. So eventually we set the mode of the Wi-Fi to be a station. And then we set the config of our station to be our new config. So this one that has now our, you know, our SSID and our password. And then we say Wi-Fi start. This is where the magic happens and the event loop for the Wi-Fi controller kicks off. So two things are gonna happen. Once we do this, we're gonna see a station initialization complete, and this function here is going to block until our Wi-Fi event group, remember this is where our status bits are stored for our events, are going to reflect either a Wi-Fi success or a Wi-Fi failure. And we will wait as long as we have to, and this port max delay is, I believe, one second. So we'll wait for this to happen, and one of these has to be true, either a Wi-Fi success or a Wi-Fi failure. So we can go up and check out the actual event loops that are gonna get ran and explain to you how they allow us to connect to the Wi-Fi. So we set up the Wi-Fi event handler here and we say if the event base is Wi-Fi, which to get here it has to be, and if the event ID is a Wi-Fi event station start, meaning the station has just turned on, right? We just said ESP Wi-Fi init. We'll tell the user, hey, we're connecting to the access point and we say ESP Wi-Fi connect. And that's it. This will connect to the Wi-Fi. What we need to be able to handle is if there is a failure or a disconnection in the station connection. So then we say, if the event is a Wi-Fi event, but it's also a Wi-Fi event station disconnected type. Here, we track the number of failures we've already had with this S retry number and say, okay, cool, no big deal. We disconnected, but we're gonna try to reconnect. And then every time we try to reconnect and we increment the number of failures we've had. If we get to the point where the failures have exceeded some max failures value, which is here, we call it 10, we say, hey guys, I, I can't connect to the Wi-Fi, so I set in the Wi-Fi event group status handler that we have had a Wi-Fi failure. Otherwise, if we get through this point where we had the event and we successfully connect, eventually we'll connect and we'll get a DHCP lease from the DHCP server, right, from the Wi-Fi network. And this event will trigger. If the event base is IP event, which again, it has to be to get here, and we have an IP event, the station got an IP, meaning we have successfully retrieved an IP from the network, we will say that we can you know, log the IP address here and we'll put into our, our event group status tracker that we've had a Wi-Fi success. So the station has started, we connect to the Wi-Fi, there are no failures, this event gets triggered, and then we set the Wi-Fi success bit in our event group. If both of those things happen, we will have a Wi-Fi success or a Wi-Fi failure in our event groups. 
So this will stop blocking at this point. Once it stops blocking, we can then retrieve the bits using this function and say, okay, if the bits retrieved are a success, cool, we successfully connected to the AP. Otherwise, if the bits and failure are true, we successfully fa or <laughs> we failed to connect to the AP. And then if somehow we get bits that are other than these two, we've had some unexpected event. There's a memory corruption. We got to get out of there. So this is all failure. So based on these outputs, we set the status of our function to either success or failure. And then before we return, we unregister ourselves as event handlers, right? Once we've gotten past this point, we now have an IP address and we are connected. We no longer want these callback functions to proc off those events. So we pull the handlers out of that loop by unregistering them from free RTOS. And then we event group delete. We delete that status container for our event loop and we return the status. So once we return, we are now back in app main. If we have successfully connected, we get a Wi-Fi success. If that is not the case, we say, hey, we failed to connect. We failed 10 times. We're just going to end it. We can't do anything about that, and we return. But once we've successfully gotten out of there, now we have an IP address. We're nice and happy. We can talk to other servers on the network. We can now use this to connect via a socket to other servers and get data, right? Have them remotely control us, or we can remotely control them or something like that. So. We will do connect to TCP server to connect to another server and then pull back data and then do something with it, right? You, you know, perform some action via the, the input that the user has given us. So in our function, connect TCP server, at this point, what's cool about Expressive is that all of the code, or most of the code is POSIX compliant, right? So if you've done any kind of standard C network programming, this is very similar to you, right? And all we're gonna do here is connect to the server and return the result. So here we connect to the TCP server by creating, you know, standard POSIX compliant structures, a SOC adder in. We say the SOC adder in family is AFINet. There's a little exclamation point, delete that. We say the SOC adder in uh, sin adder, or the, the, you know, the server address is some hard-coded IP address that I can show you guys later. And then the port is some hard-coded port, right? Very straightforward C programming stuff. So once we've gotten away from the ESP32 Wi-Fi driver interface, we can just do very basic, you know, programming at pretty much the, the Linux POSIX compliant level. We connect to the server, which is specified by this IP address and this port. If we don't connect successfully, then we say that we failed, then we take some action, we close the socket and we leave. If we did connect successfully, we zero out some read buffer and then we read from that socket over the network and we print it to the screen. And if we wanted to, we could say, if, you know, stir compare of read buffer and hello is true, then we ESP log I, we did it, right? Something like that, pretty something, something silly. Cool. You take some action based on user input, the whole purpose of this. You can use this to make your project behave in whatever way you want it to, right? But this is just getting the network stack off the ground. So I'll show you guys it in action. Um, I've got it set up here. I have my Raspberry Pi ready to roll here. This is that host you saw in the uh, connect script where the IP address is listening here. First, we're gonna idf.py build. I'm not gonna do that because I've already actually you know, built the code. Then we're going to flash the board. I'm not gonna do that because I've already actually built the code. But then we are going to idf.py monitor. By monitoring the code, we can actually talk to the USB port here. See here, we have connected to the server. You can pull back up the uh, cam link and we see we have a connection from the device. I will type in some code. Hello there, darling. The device has now gotten that data from our server remotely over the network. And we can do whatever we want with this. We can have this be commands from the user. We can have the ESP32 send an update over the network about maybe it's, you know, the network information, the temperature outside. You can have this thing move motors around and do whatever you want. Um, anyway, guys, that's all I got. I hope this was informative. I hope you learned something. If you did, do me a favor, hit like, hit subscribe, and I'll see you guys next week as we dive deeper in ESP32 peripherals. I'll see you guys then. Bye.